Good evening. The headlines tonight, the 7th of June, 1944. Allied forces have control of the landing beaches. The town of Bayeux has been captured. But German resistance is growing and there's fierce fighting around Caen. We now know that the Americans suffered heavy losses yesterday as they went ashore. The Allied bombing offensive has switched to targets inland. In the birthday honours, there's a knighthood for Alexander Fleming, who discovered penicillin. And the latest portal house has been unveiled. A new mode of living, or is it too low and too small? Of course it is small, but the planning is good. And the house could easily be worked and would be most economical to run. Heavy fighting is taking place along the Normandy coast. Huge Allied reinforcements of men and equipment have been landed on the invasion beaches. German resistance is growing, but the Allies are believed to have achieved their first significant success. The town of Bayeux has surrendered to the Allies this evening, and the main Bayeux to Caen road has been blocked at several points. But according to German reports, the Allied advance towards Caen itself has been halted. American forces are advancing inland from two beaches further west towards the Cherbourg Peninsula. It's now known that the United States First Army suffered heavy casualties yesterday while trying to gain a foothold on one of those beaches. We have two reports beginning with yesterday's American landings. American warships began bombardment at 6.30 yesterday morning, 40 minutes before their landings on the eastern beachhead. But when the men came ashore, it was clear German defences had survived intact. Heavy and intense fire was targeted on the troops as they disembarked from the landing craft, seasick and overloaded. Many were cut down before they reached the sand. Others fled back into the water. The aim had been to secure a landing strip some 7,000 yards wide, but the sea was rougher than expected, the resistance more savage. Under vicious German gunfire, the U.S. 5 Corps sustained staggering losses. Fifteen minutes after landing, the entire A Company was out of action. Others lost up to 70% of their men and officers killed outright. There was no advance, no order, no communications. For two hours, it appeared this landing was a major disaster. But as the morning wore on, fortunes changed. British and American warships moved closer in to blast the German artillery. Some reinforcements managed to land, and the shocked survivors from the initial carnage began to regroup. By afternoon, they had cleared most of the German trenches and taken prisoners from the artillery emplacements. The resistance was cracking. As the US troops fought their way to the cliffs, the extent of the casualties became clearer. Tonight, reports are coming in of more than 2,000 dead. Already, many of the wounded are back on board ship, bound for the south coast. Against all odds and expectations, there is now an eastern beachhead under firm U.S. control. But the cost has been nothing less than tragic. British troops fighting their way south from the invasion beaches into the outskirts of Bayeux found that the bulk of German forces had pulled out earlier in the day, leaving a scattering of snipers to harry the invader. Each had to be winkled out. Bayeux, home of the celebrated medieval tapestry, is a prize the first sizable French town to be freed from Hitler's yoke. More to the point today, for the advancing soldiery of British 30 Corps, Bayeux is a strategically important junction of seven roads. Elsewhere, it was largely a day of holding captured ground, except at the east end of the British Canadian sector, round Caen. Allied military sources say that this substantial Norman town is the key to the success of British-Canadian operations. 
Balkan is surrounded by open country and German army units there are well dug in. A column of British tanks filmed here coming out to take a breather after a day of hard fighting had been stopped at Le Bizet, a tiny hamlet just three miles short of Caen. They found themselves up against the crack 21st German Panzer Division. Nobody has got much closer than Le Bizet, despite reports to the contrary. German strategic reserves, for sure, are on the way. Rommel's counter-offensive has yet to come. The huge airborne assault is continuing behind enemy lines. One of those who crash-landed by glider in last night's first invasion was the BBC's Chester Wilmot. He sent us this report. We put the nose down. We stiffened ourselves with the jolt of the touchdown and lifted our feet clear of the floor in case something might rip through the belly. The touchdown itself was perfect, but as the wheels bounced and lurched over the furrows and ditches, we heard the harsh straining of the wooden fuselage, the crash of posts hitting the nose and undercarriage. Then a last-minute lurch and swerve to the right as the pilot swung our glider clear of an auto safely to back. No one was even scratched. We shouted with joy and relief and bundled out into the field. Around us, we could see the silhouettes of other gliders, twisted and wrecked, making grotesque patterns against the sky. Some had buried their noses in the soil. Others had lost a wheel or a wing. One had crashed into a house. Two had crashed into each other. And yet, as we marched off past these twisting for our own good fortune, other troops were clambering out of almost every one of these as casually as they might leave a bus. Allied fighter bombers are now conducting a round-the-clock attack on centres of communication, including Caen. French civilians are fleeing into the countryside. Our warships continue to add to the bombardment, engaging inland targets behind the beaches. Once again last night, even earlier than usual, the RAF's heavy bombers set off into the darkness against the Germans. But there's been a switch in bomber tactics, away from the coast, inland, to try blocking German reinforcements being brought up to the battle. Overnight, more than a thousand RAF Lancasters, Halifaxes and Mosquitoes hit towns and other centres of communication in Normandy. Places like Lisieux and Coutances were particularly badly damaged. Vere and Saint-Lô had their town centres destroyed. In some areas, the bombers ran into heavy German flak. Around Caen, German anti-aircraft gunners hammered away at the waves of planes passing overhead. Six of the 11 British bombers lost last night were shot down in this attack. During the day, American liberators and marauders continued the relentless aerial assault. Inevitably, the targeting of towns and rail and road junctions means that many French civilians have been hit as well. For the French, this taste of being bombed in order to be liberated will have been a bitter one. Although the Allies have dropped thousands of leaflets urging civilians to stay away from German military concentrations, it's accepted by Allied headquarters that there will have been many French casualties. At Caen, where the invasion force has hit tough German resistance, much of the old town where William the Conqueror lies buried was ablaze. Many refugees are fleeing. In Caen, it's estimated that well over a thousand civilians were killed in the raids. The German High Command has conceded that the Allied operation has gained a foothold. Their news agency has said that the bridgehead is now up to 8 miles deep and 20 miles wide. A commentator on German radio reported that German defences have been very heavily taxed. In Paris, the Germans have declared a state of emergency. Parks have been turned into detention camps and thousands of people are said to have been arrested. Broadcasts by the Vichy government, the French government collaborating with the Germans, are telling the French to stay at home and not get involved. The news of the Allied landings in Normandy reached the citizens of occupied Paris in a broadcast on Vichy radio yesterday. Only the German communique was delivered. There was no immediate comment from the Vichy leaders. But later in the day, the head of the Vichy regime, Marshal Pétain, responded to President Eisenhower's broadcast with his own radio address. He urged French people to stay in their posts and maintain essential services. La France devient ainsi un champ de bataille. Français, n'aggravez pas nos malheurs par des actes qui risqueraient d'appeler sur vous de tragiques représailles. Les circonstances de la bataille pourront conduire l'armée allemande à prendre des dispositions spéciales dans les zones de combat. 
accepter cette nécessité. This message was reiterated in a second Vichy broadcast, which stated that French citizens should not take orders from an American general. The broadcast was made by Pétain's deputy, Laval. Two days before the landings, the leader of the Free French, currently in exile, General Charles de Gaulle, arrived in London. Yesterday, de Gaulle broadcast to the French people, rallying them to action. La bataille suprême est engagée. Après tant de combats, de fureur, de douleur, voici venu le choc décisif, le choc tant espéré. In Paris, it is not immediately clear which call will win the most support over the next few days. The Vichy government enjoys little popular support. In view of the emergency, it is now considering plans to conscript all young people to be employed on public works. At the same time, many French people are not yet convinced that the Allies can triumph. New medicines are available to help the wounded returning from the D-Day beaches. And today, in the King's Birthday Honours List, there are knighthoods for the two men who developed penicillin, the new drug which fights infection. Professor Alexander Fleming discovered penicillin in 1928. It was developed for medical use by Professor H. W. Florey of Oxford University. Penicillin is now being widely used to treat war casualties. And it's been announced that the bulk of the drug supplies are being reserved for the use of the armed forces. The latest model of the portal prefabricated house has gone on show. Named after the Minister of Works, Lord Portal, earlier models of the house have been strongly criticised by the people who will have to live in them as too small, too narrow, too noisy and too low. Britain's first factory-made show house, prototype of the half million promised by Mr Churchill as emergency dwellings for demobilised servicemen and their families. Bright idea number one is the living room fireplace, which also provides heated air for two bedrooms. This house of the future has no stairs, no dust collecting wainscoting, and is intended to last about ten years. Plenty of built-in cupboards are a welcomed feature. Married women on the staff of the Ministry of Works helped in the design. The kitchen is compact, but the initial blueprint didn't provide sufficient facilities for washing clothes. They're going to fix a small copper now in the bathroom. The refrigerator tops the list of the 80 pounds worth of internal fittings built into Churchill Villa. <music> Bedroom number two also has plenty of cupboards and, like the other rooms, is central heated. Housewives will want to know where to hang the washing in wet weather, and many may criticize the width of the hall. But here's one opinion. I think it is very good indeed for a small house for the men who are coming home and the women who have been working hard in the factories and want to get back to family life. I think it is an ideal house. Letters are already on their way to servicemen fighting in France, according to the Army Postal Service. The GPO rates for mail are a penny for a card and three halfpence for a letter. Finally, the weather conditions in the Channel are brighter. The strong northwesterly wind has moderated. The sea is calmer. And that was the news tonight, the 7th of June, 1944. D-Day plus one, as the Allied armies started to move on into France from their Normandy beachheads. From the BBC, good night.